as it has been said, we are in Black History Month. Most of us know black history is American history. And black history should therefore be studied and understood year round. The month of February is indeed, however, an opportunity to expand even more our knowledge and our understanding of what has brought us as a country to acknowledge what we call black history, to accept the truths about it and to repent as the spirit compels us and to continue to strive for healing and wholeness and celebration of a people and for a people who have endured much, accomplished much, and who believe despite all that has happened that God is indeed on our side. Once again, and I've referenced this scripture recently quite often, Proverbs 4, 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it cost all you have, get understanding. There's so much to understand about the transatlantic slave trade, so much to understand about people of African descent, so much to understand about what was lost by people of African descent as a result of the slave trade. There's so much to understand about the impact even on the motherland, on Mother Africa. And really, there's so much to understand about humanity. For human history includes such inhumane atrocities as the transatlantic slave trades and its successors, Jim Crow, lynching, the execution of justice fighters, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Medver, Medgar Evers, John and Robert Kennedy, but not only that and so many more, but also atrocities such as the Holocaust and a host of wars, even just in our lifetime including the Ukraine and Russian war. I Googled this morning to see what the latest is because we don't hear much anymore because of the Palestinian and Israeli war. Where between the two wars, over 500,000 people have died with approximately 13,000, if not more, children among the dead and counting both of these wars, as we know, continue. From school shootings to shootings on the streets of urban cities across this country, country to children who are casualties of war, it just seems to me that someone should be asking the question, what about the children? And while that is a poignant and valid question, a question that should force us to lift up the innocent lives of children in order to protect them from harm, the spirit led me in a different direction than I thought I was going this morning. It's often said, what kind of world are we leaving our children? I want to ask a different question this morning. What kind of children are we leaving our world? Children are sponges. How many of us know that? Quick story. One of my clergy friends and I were talking about our children last week. His son, an adorable two-year-old, turns anything he can into a microphone, sets up his toys as a congregation, and preaches and praises God, saying, Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah, and he's two. That brought to mind one of my fondest memories about my son, Van, who, who when he was two, and you may know his, his dad, my, my ex-husband is a musician, he's a pastor now, but musician and minister of music, and, and I was a choir director, someday choir, someday. <laughs> so one day I'm sitting on the couch feeding the newborn Vanessa, and have gospel music on, and my son turns his potty into a drum. He's had, he has drumsticks at this point, and Elmo has a guitar. 
And he's got Elmo going, and he's hitting on the drums on the potty. And he turns to me, and his little two-year-old voice says, stand up. I'm feeding Vanessa. I say, what? He said, stand up. He wanted me to stand up and be the choir. <laughs> He'd been to choir rehearsal already from the time he was born. And he had the drums going, and Elmo was playing the guitar. The gospel music was going. And the only thing that was missing was the choir was not standing up. So I say again, children are sponges. And if these two-year-old little boys can emulate their parents and their surroundings, what are children across the city and the country and the world taking in from their parents and their families and their surroundings? After all, if we're honest about it, much of what we see in our own lives stems from when we were children. So yes, it is good to ask, what kind of world are we leaving our children? But the question we need to begin to ask is, what kind of children are we leaving our world? They'll be here, we'll be gone. So we need to ask the question, what will our children and our grandchildren have within them to contribute to a world of peace and not chaos? What will they have within them to be peacemakers and to stand for justice? And, and that takes me to our text on today from the lectionary about the dedication of Jesus at the temple. The story holds guidance for us that can aid us in our intentional care of and for children. So let's go to the text. Luke 2.22 reads, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. The scripture lifts up the role of ritual and tradition and the reality of spirituality in the life of a child. Jesus is brought to the temple to be dedicated to God, as was the tradition using the rituals of the Jewish people, as it says, according to the law of Moses. R rituals and tradition give meaning to life and to relationships. They help establish a child's identity in the family and in the community. They depict the importance of a child's life and represent human connection and dignity. Rituals can remind adults of the sanctity of the life of children. Yet in post-colonial capitalistic society, this post-colonial capitalistic society, rituals seem to have taken a back seat. Many rituals have, lost, have been lost or have changed over time as people have Americanized and left many traditions behind. One of the things I lament over most about slavery was the loss or is the loss of rituals for people of African descent. Rituals that gave identity and purpose to children that told them they belonged to something greater than themselves, that welcomed them into not only the world, but into the tribe, nurtured their spirits as part of the tribe. And while African Americans have established new rituals in this land, I often wonder about the impact of the loss of African rituals and African spirituality. For along with the loss of rituals is the loss of spirituality. In the text, we see spirituality front and center. For they brought Jesus to present him to God. And as a firstborn male child, they designated him as holy to the Lord, set apart for God's service. 
We see spirituality front and center in the text. Now here's what the Spirit said to me. We must begin to think of children as spiritual beings from the beginning of their lives so that we can ensure that they are nurtured fully, not just in mind. You know, we read and talk to newborns and, and, and not just in body. We, we feed them and swaddle them and bathe them, the things we do for babies, but also in spirit. There needs to be a realization, the Spirit said to me, and an amplification that the spiritual life of a child needs to be nurtured. Parents and families and even the broader society need to come to a new understanding of the importance of the spiritual life of a child, of how mind, body, and spirit are all intertwined. For example, we need to understand that a child's exposure to violence and a child's exposure to hatred or bigotry both do harm to the child. Such exposure, according to my friend neuroscientist Clara Takarabe, they do tremendous harm to a child. And I quote Clara, abuse and bigotry equals fear and aggression in the brain. This impedes, Clara says, a person's imagination. It impedes their ability to dream about life or a future. It even impedes a person's empathy for others. They don't care, she said, as much about how others are doing, and they may not even care if they hurt others. They've been harmed. Literally, the brain has been harmed. In the text, we see rituals that highlight Jesus as a human being with a spirit. He's mind, body, and spirit, and so are all children. I thought I'd get an amen. That's all right, I hear your lights. Jesus' spiritual life mattered. And so should the spiritual life of children in your family, in my family, and all families. Notice I didn't say their Christian life, for Jesus wasn't Christian. I said their spiritual life, that as humans, we are mind, body, and spirit, and in the life of a child, all three need to be nurtured. So when we ask what about the children, we need to include what about the mental health of a child, and what about the spiritual life of children? We need to be intentional about nurturing their full selves. I've heard some of your stories about the beloved Christian educators in this church who nurtured you as children. That brings me to verse 24. Let's talk about the two turtle doves. Verse 24 says, and they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young or two young pigeons. The sacrifice is offered, this is the sacrifice, excuse me, that is offered by those who were poor since they could not afford a lamb. An acceptable sacrifice of the poor was two turtle doves or two pigeons a sign that Jesus was born into poverty, yet his life mattered and his spirit was nurtured. What about the children? There's a parental, a familial, and a societal responsibility to not forget that children, all children, are mind, body, and spirit and should be valued and nurtured as such. Nurturing children would make the world a better place. So Jesus' parents intentionally brought him to the temple that day to honor his spiritual life. And there's two other adults participating that day, Dr. J, Simeon, and the prophet Anna. Verse 27 to 28 show us that Simeon, guided by the Spirit, came into the temple, took the baby Jesus in his arms, and praised God, and then spoke prophetically about the future of the child. Verse 36 says, there was also a prophet Anna. Somebody say amen for the prophet Anna. The daughter of Phanuel, 
of the tribe of Asher. She was 84 years old, the text says. She never left the temple but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And well, she, she also participated in the event of this child. For the text says that she praised God and spoke about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon and Anna represent the righteous, the devout, the people of faith. And they saw greatness in the child. Both doing prophetic work, Simeon spoke to the heart of the parents about their child, and Anna spread the good news to all of those around her. They both spoke out loud about who he was and his promising future. And how much more should we do the same in and for our community? And let us not miss, before I go too quickly, that Anna was a prophet. No wonder Jesus advocated for women and would never have approved of the exclusion of women from pulpits and pastorates. He was blessed and prophesied over by a woman prophet right at the beginning. Who knows whether that story told by his parents further inspired his stand for women and inclusion of women throughout the gospel. Prophet Anna prayed over me. As people of God, we should see the potential of greatness. Matter of fact, we should see the greatness in all children. As people of faith, we should be leading the way. I know some of you are thinking, but we don't have that many children. They may not be in here, but they're certainly out there, and all of us in here go out there. There are ways to impact the lives of children. We should be leading the way and speaking life about children. We should be outspoken about the promise and the potential of all children, and we should be leading the way in the protection of children. Involved in the setting of educational standards, involved in child advocacy work. Entering professions that protect and care for and educate and heal children. Do I have any teachers in the house today? Come on, let's give God praise for educators. We can do better than that. Let's give God praise and we need to be praying to continue to compensate educators. I know I'm not the only one to get sick when I see what an NBA player makes or a superstar musician makes versus what an educator makes who has society's children all week long and have to come out of pocket for resources. And we wonder what's going on in our society. As people of faith, I believe this text is telling us that we have a role in the uplift of children. That if we're not in the classroom, we can sit on school councils or community organizations that care for, educate, and advocate for children driven by our faith, wondering how you can have an impact on the world, have an impact on children. You got extra time? Join the school council. The local school council, volunteer in the school, speak life. Let's start programs as we do our visioning and strategic planning for the church. They have us looking back over the history of the church. And one of the things that continues to come up is the nursery school and how we had children among us and we were pouring into children. As we think about the, his the future of the church, let us not forget the children. If we begin to take seriously the idea that children are the present, they're here now, and they are the future. And if we really begin to ask ourselves, what kind of children are we leaving our world? There's an African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. And if we really began to take responsibility for raising and covering children, then we might have more hope for the future, just think about them and the future in their hands. Have we prepared them or have we simply sheltered them? And, and what they have to do when they get there is their business and they'll figure it out. No, we can indeed be intentional about 
preparing children. We might have more hope than we currently have right now. Psalm 127.3 says, children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a gift, another version says, from the Lord. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up a child in the way that he or she or they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now let me close with this. If the kingdom of God is going to draw near, a society built on love, and justice, reconciliation, and human flourishing, it will be through children. I didn't make that up. The prophet Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah eleven six. Listen to this. The wolf and the lamb will, lie to, will live together. The leopard will lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will will feed together, putting together some animals that will typically devour one another. Isaiah the prophet says these will live together and then the last part says, and a little child shall lead them. And if we hope to see or even dream thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if we believe we can see a better world, then we're investing in the lives and the futures of children. We're ensuring they understand not only themselves, but that they understand others and they understand the world. We're ensuring that they are not being sheltered from history, but are being told the truth, for they shall know the truth, and the truth shall set them free. We're ensuring that they value difference, that they see color and love it, that they respect people's boundaries and choices and demand respect of their own. We're careful about what they consume, not just through their mouths, but through their ears and through their eyes. And we're challenging those who put out filth, filth, excuse me, for children to consume. We're ensuring they have healthy self-esteem and that they hold others in high esteem. We're correcting them when they bully and we're getting them help when they've already been traumatized. If we hope to see a better future, then we're investing. That's how we live that out. We can't just say, I want the future to be better for my children. We're intentionally investing in the lives and the futures of children. So some are asking, what kind of world are we leaving our children? I suggest we ask a different question. What kind of children are we leaving our world? And let's be intentional about the nurture, the well-being of mind, body, and spirit of children. God bless you. Amen.